Theistic Evolution Critique, five questions. We've been going through the book uh, Theistic Evolution, a ph scientific, philosophical, and theological critique, edited by a number of people, including J.P. Moreland and Stephen Meyer. And uh, to set the stage again, as these are kind of standalone talks, um, or at least mostly. Um, <clears throat> there are several ways you can look at uh, uh, the history of life. One of them is young life creationism, various flavors of that. One of them is what's traditionally called old earth creationism, but it probably should be called old life creationism. Um, there is theistic evolution, which acknowledges intelligent design. There is theistic evolution, which does not acknowledge the possibility of telling that intelligent design exists. Although you'll find a few people playing with uh, God is playing in the gaps that you can't tell. But the most important thing for them is you can't tell. And there is finally atheistic evolution, which says there is no God, and therefore he didn't help it in any way whatsoever. The book is primarily aimed not at atheistic evolution, although it does take its lumps, but primarily at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. And this chapter here is by Paul Nelson. And it is in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution, but section two, which is the case against universal common descent and for a unique human origin. If you wanted to, you could say it's actually section two, part one, because this is the case against universal common descent, not necessarily for a unique human origin, although the next chapter will specifically deal with uh, human and chimpanzee um, differences. Um, and this one is entitled, Five Questions Everyone Should Ask about common descent. The summary of the chapter, which is sort of a, uh, an abstract, if you like, uh, is according to the theory of universal common descent, all organisms on Earth have descended by modification from a common ancestor dubbed the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. Within the past 20 years, however, a growing number of evolutionary biologists have expressed doubts that LUCA ever existed. Their skepticism of LUCA, and hence of universal common descent, rests on an important rule of biological inference known as the principle of continuity. The principle of continuity holds that every step in any evolutionary pathway must be biologically possible. This principle, this principle actually challenges universal common descent, or the tree of life, not only at its base, but throughout its branches as well. Five key questions should be asked of any hypothesis of common descent to make sure that the hypothesis answers the demands of the principle of continuity and also to examine the larger context within which universal common descent lives as a biological and historical theory. UCD should not be maintained as an axiom, but should be vulnerable to evidential challenges like any other scientific theory, like the theory of gravity for that matter. Introduction, is common descent really a theory that no biologist doubts? Biology, a familiar aphorism tells us, is a science of exceptions. The protein hemoglobin binds oxygen molecules with the iron atoms at its center carrying oxygen in the bloodstream of animals, except when it doesn't. Hemocyanin carries oxygen in animals such as the octopus and the horseshoe crab, binding the molecule with copper, not iron making their blood appear blue, not red. Draw any generalization about life on Earth, and from a, the back of the room, the exceptions will stand and take a bow. A handful of biological propositions, however, seem truly exceptionless or universal in scope. Number one, all, uni all organisms are made of cells. Or, number two, all organisms have other organisms as parents. Number three, all organisms have descended with modification from a single common ancestor, itself an organism, designated 
the last universal common ancestor, abbreviated Luca, at the root of the tree of life. Now, these propositions about life on earth are seen by most biologists to hold so generally that each is thought to rise to the status of a theory or even a law. Thus, we have respectively the cell theory, the law of biogenesis, and the theory of common descent. Here, many biologists, including theistic evolutionists, would add, and with some forth forcefulness, and no respected, well-respected biologist doubts any of these theories or laws. Yet they do. Not the cell theory, or the law of biogenesis, however. Today, it is the theory of common descent that is in trouble, possibly very serious trouble from which it may never escape. Thereupon hangs a tale which I tell in this chapter. When the late National Academy of Sciences molecular evolutionist Carl Wuss, Wussy, my uh, German is not very good, uh, wrote, the time has come for biology to go beyond the doctrine of common descent. He was using doctrine in a derogatory sense to mean a scientific concept held dogmatically standing in the way of biological understanding. Geneticist Craig Venter said that common descent was counter counterintuitive to him. I don't necessarily buy that there's a single ancestor. It's counterintuitive to me. I think we, have, we may have thought thousands of recent common ancestors and they are not necessarily so common. Neither Wussi nor Venter were motivated by creationism or intelligent design which they oppose, as do the growing number of evolutionary biologists who openly express their doubts about common descent. Rather, these biologists see the tree of life fracturing at its base near where the thickest part of the trunk, that is, the major domains of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, emerge from the prebiotic soil. Nonetheless, while these biologists see common descent in this universal sense as strictly false, they think that most groups of single-celled organisms, as well as fungi, plants, and animals, do share common ancestors higher up in the tree of life. Yet the same reasoning that leads skeptics of universal common descent to doubt the existence of Luca can readily be extended to the supposed common ancestors of more recent branches in the tree of life. Doubts about Luca arise from its apparent biological impossibility under an important rule of biological inference known as the principle of continuity. As we shall see, the principle of continuity actually challenged the tree of life everywhere, not simply at its base. But common descent and continuity are themselves embedded in a wider scientific and philosophical context. How one evaluates the theory depends on the decisions one makes about that wider context on questions such as, the probability of the naturalistic origin of life, or abiogenesis, how many times abiogenesis occurred, and whether intelligent design is a live possibility. To paraphrase John Don, no theory is an island, and common descent is no exception. The relevance of common descent needs uh, to the subject of this book hardly needs elaborating. Biologos, the leading organization in the United States promoting theistic evolution, states that evolution means, among other things, that all, all the life forms on Earth share a common ancestor, that is, common descent. To stress that no legitimate doubt exists about the theory, Biologos adds, there is very little debate in the scientific community about this broad characterization of evolution. Anyone who claims otherwise is either uninformed or deliberately trying to mislead. Shut up. The observational evidence explained by common ancestry is overwhelming. But serious questions about common descent have existed since Darwin's day and are even more significant today. Let's abbreviate uh, common descent as UCD, that is universal common descent. This will stand for Darwin's idea that all organisms on Earth stem from a single common ancestor. We'll use CD for a hypothesis about the shared ancestry of particular groups of organisms where UCD may or may not be presupposed. The scope of UCD includes all life on this planet and even particular CD theories such as common ancestry of the animals, and of course that would include chimpanzees and humans. Uh, given this vast breadth, it is impossible in a single chapter or even an entire book to address every dimension of the problem, although in chapter 11, Casey Luskin in introduces some of the main controversies. 
Instead, this chapter analyzes how common descent hypotheses are constructed and how they are tested. Setting these matters in the wider context of the origin of life and the possibility of an intelligent design. And I would add in, in the wider context of, of the philosophy of science as well. Five key questions capture the most important issues arising from UCD and CD. Before we consider the five questions, however, we should, be, we should clear away some potential misunderstandings about the relationship between concepts of evolution, common descent, materialism or naturalism, and intelligent design. The terms evolution and common descent do not name the same idea. That is true. Refuting UCD does not necessarily refute evolution because the latter idea allows for much more th than common descent or shared ancestry. The philosophies of materialism and naturalism do not entail UCD. For that reason, falsifying UCD would not necessarily threaten those worldviews, although I would disagree with that statement. We'll come back to it. Lamarck, for example, was a materialist with a respect to biology, but he described evolution as occurring in multiple independent lineages, each spontaneously generated. Such a process yields separate trees of life, not a single tree. And there's a figure to show that. Ernst Haeckel is another person with the same general views. Lastly, nearly all evolutionists who currently doubt UCD, including Venter and, um, and Wussi, um, accept naturalism or materialism as their philosophy of science. Common descent may be false at one level of taxonomic inclusiveness yet true at another level. For example, all wolves and dogs could have a common ancestor and yet um, not necessarily wolves and dogs versus, say, caterpillars or, or pine trees. Common descent and intelligent design are not mutually exclusive. An ID colleague of mine, biochemist Michael Behe, arg argues vigorously for design while also accepting UCD. So did the Harvard botanist Asa Gray, who had a lot of correspondence with Darwin. Given these points and the range of positions on offer, the reader may be wondering, well, if UCD is endorsed by some intelligent design theorists and if UCD and materialism are independent of each other, why bother challenging UCD or CD at all? Wouldn't the wiser course be to withhold judgment about the theory, at least provisionally, since most biologists still accept UCD? Perhaps, but we think the wisest course is to pursue the truth. Here is the only question about UCD ultimately worth asking. Is the theory true? If UCD is true, then Christians, indeed everyone, will have to make their peace with it. If UCD isn't true, however, then no one... Christians included, should hang on to the theory. To begin, we should examine how evolutionary biologists normally infer that two or more species share a common ancestor. The anatomy of inferences to common ancestry. Richard Dawkins says many things that are beautifully clear. Wrong, maybe, but nonetheless clear and easy to follow. In The Blind Watchmaker, Dawkins explains why he thinks all organisms share a common ancestor. It is a fact of great significance that every living thing, no matter how different from others in external appearance it may be, speaks almost exactly the same language at the level of genes. The genetic code is universal. I regard this as near conclusive proof that all organisms are descended from a single common ancestor. The odds of the same dictionary of arbitrary meanings arising twice are almost unimaginably small. We can use this excerpt from Dawkins as a model for showing how common descent hypotheses are constructed. Every necessary element of any CD hypothesis is present and working within his argument. Dawkins is making a case for UCD. Indeed, the universal genetic code argument for UCD is one of the most widespread in biology, occurring not only in popular books like The Blind Watchmaker, but in textbooks and the technical literature as well. Figure 12.3 depicts Dawkins' argument. Boxes P and Q, we're going to show that in just a minute, could be any two species or taxa, similar taxon meaning biological group, 
Let's say taxon P is a domesticated dog, and taxon Q is the portobello mushrooms. P and Q both exhibit biological characters, in this instance, the genetic code. Biological characters include any observable features of organisms ranging from their molecular details, such as the genetic code, up to complex behaviors such as nest building or speech. Dawkins asked us to decide which scenario is more likely. Did the character genetic code arise once in the unknown common ancestor for P and Q, or twice independently, as pictured in 12.3b? And there's the 12.3, and you can see the they inherited uh, something from a common ancestor, even though they are different, and it requires a transformation pathway to get from the common ancestor to P, and on another one to get to Q. And of course, you have to originate the common ancestor as well. Uh, whereas a separate descent or ancestry has um, a pathway to P and a pathway to Q that don't cross each other. Now, the single arrow in figure 12.3a leading to box CA, the unknown common ancestor where the code first appears, and the two separate arrows leading to P and Q in 12.3b become important. In fact, these arrows, which we can call the origination pathways and probabilities, carry the weight of Dawkins' argument. Origination probabilities are estimated from the evolutionary processes and mechanisms that cause new biological characters to appear. The odds of the same dictionary of arbitrary meanings arising twice, argues Dawkins, are almost unimaginably small. And I would agree with him, at least without intelligent design. Here's why. Let us suppose the origination probability for the first appearance of the genetic code occurs even once is far less than 1.0. And Dawkins estimate the probability of P to be vanishingly small, much closer to 0 0.0 than 1.0 because the code appears to him to be a chemically arbitrary frozen accident. If so, then invoking two such frozen accidents occurring independently of each other, as in 12.3b, the separate origin scenario, yet with those accidents somehow landing on the same apparently arbitrary molecular meanings, will be the product p times p, or p squared, because the independent probabilities in 12.3b multiply by each other. Originating the genetic code even once was, a hard, was hard enough, but twice the same code? Are you kidding? At this point, Dawkins' argument should, be, should make sense to the reader. We catch plagiarists by using the same probabilistic reasoning. If boxes P and Q and 12.3b, for example, re re represented two texts, supposedly written independently of each other, yet they contained whole paragraphs that were word for word identical, a scenario of separate origins would strike us as utterly unlikely. Common descent is a theory of transformation, not similarity. This is an important point. Darkin's arguments for UCD may seem conclusive, but how could we test it? After all, UCD isn't supposed to be a deduction or an axiom, but an empirical hypothesis, potentially vulnerable to contrary evidence, but at least theoretically surviving it, and that's its power. The answer starts by thinking carefully about what any co common descent hypothesis asserts when compared to its logical opposite, separate origins. Notice the arrows leading from the common ancestor to uh, CA to taxa P and Q. These are the evolutionary transformation pathways and probabilities. And we need to know them too before we can decide <coughs> if common descent or separate origins is more likely. We need to know these pathways and the underlying causal processes operating during the branching from CA because if their associated probabilities turn out to be too small or actually zero, common ancestry loses to separate origins. And that is because common descent is not mainly a theory of similarity, rather common descent is mainly a theory of transformation. The theory claims it is biologically possible to transform species starting with a common ancestral form and ending with very different descendant taxa. Taxa P and Q have different names because they exhi exhibit different characters. If CD is true, those characters must arise as novel transformations on the branches 
from the common ancestor. Common descent must explain the origin of differences, novel characters, and not simply similarities along natural pathways or branching lineages starting with an ancestral form which did not possess those characters. Logically, CA cannot exhibit the same characters that define its descendants, both of them, because if the same novel features distinguishing taxon P, for example, also existed in CA, then the ancestral and descendant species would necessarily belong to the same taxon in which case Q would have derived not from the common ancestor but from P. And of course, if Q is the same as P, then, then there is no difference. This claim, namely that species can be and were viably transformed over time, fundamentally distinguishes both UCD and CD from separate origins. Similarity occurs in both scenarios. Transformation, however, does not. Therefore, finding and testing mechanisms and processes of species transformation represents the main explanatory challenge facing UCD and CD, as Darwin understood in 1859. Question one, if species were not connected by common descent, how would we know it? This is our first of our five questions. Many of the answers to this question in the biological letter may strike uh, one as facetious. The author appears not to take the question seriously. After all, common descent is a fact, and who worries about testing facts? And therefore, offers what seemed to be a flippant reply. Consider, for instance, evolutionary biologist John Maynard Smith's proposed test for neo-Darwinian evolution. If someone discovers a deep-sea fish with varying numbers of luminous dots on its tail, the number at any one time having the property of a prime number, I should regard this as rather strong evidence against neo-Darwinism. And if the dots took up in turn the exact configuration of the heavenly constellations, I should regard it as an adequate disproof. The apparent flippancy of this answer, however, conceals a deeper truth. If we ask why the hypothetical characters of constellations on deep sea fish would disprove common descent, we uncover a bona fide test first proposed by Darwin and widely used by evolutionary biologists today. UCD and CD claim species can be dramatically transformed over time and in the process can give rise to the entirely novel characters which define new taxa. As Darwin himself realized, however, if those transformations cannot occur, UCD and CD would absolutely break down. And this is a famous quote from the origin of species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. This test proposed by Darwin in The Origin of Species has come to be known as the principle of continuity. The principle of continuity, hereafter continuity, asserts that every point in any hypothesized pathway of evolutionary transformation must be biologically possible. There are critters that go from common ancestor to A and other critters that go from common ancestor to B and they all could live. This may seem to be a truism since Darwin, however, continuity has been widely employed by a biologist to test hypothesized evolutionary pathways. In 1968, for example, Francis Crick use continuity to rule out certain hypotheses about the evolution of the genetic code. These hypotheses propose that the size of codons, triplets uh, currently, tr triplets of DNA nucleotides specifying amino acids in protein assembly, has changed from one to two to three nucleotides in length. In other words, they weren't always triplets. They were duplets or whatever you want to call them. Um, <coughs> This seems highly unlikely, argued Crick, since it violates the pro uh, principle of continuity. A change in codon size necessarily makes nonsense of all previous messages and would almost certainly be lethal. Figure 4, 12.4, uh, illustrates Crick's argument. I, uh, you can look it up in the book. The hypothesis pathway from R with one or two nucleotide length codons to S with three nucleotide co length codons would necessarily pass through an inviable transitional phase, Crick argued, because the amino acid specifying information carried by the shorter codons would be disrupted if their size increased. 
a state incompatible with protein assembly and hence cell function. Here's a natural language analogy. And you can see if you break it into different places, it's very hard to read and you really have to kind of imagine it again. Uh, it makes no sense in English until you chop it back into the proper size pieces. Continuity demands reproductive capability because being able to reproduce is an absolute necessity, that is, essential condition for the organisms in any evolutionary lineage. There is, quite literally, no failing to leave offspring in common descent. Moreover, continuity also demands no jumps and no foresight. Evolutionary processes cannot jump to distant destinations, that is, novel, complex characters, because undirected processes, by definition, do not know where they are going and therefore can't aim at it. Darwin understood the no jumps demand of continuity because he put it front and center in the opening of the origin. Some might say, someone might say he noted that after a certain unknown number of generations, some bird had given birth to a woodpecker. Of course, you'd have to have two birds given birth to two woodpeckers, but th that's beside the point. But this assumption seems to be, to me, to be no explanation, for it leaves the case of the co-adaptations of organic beings to each other and their, to their physical conditions of life untouched and unexplained. It is therefore of the highest importance to gain a clear insight into the means of modification and co-adaptation. That's, of course, from the origin. We need to know the details of the pathways of transformation of what Darwin called the means of modification in order to decide if an evolutionary pathway is possible or not. As explained by Yuri Wolf and Eugene Koonin, that's that Eugene Koonin, continuity applies when the origin of any novel complex system is hypothesized to have occurred. When an evolutionary biologist strives to explain the origin of a truly novel system that is seen only in its elaborately complex state and at face value appears to be irreducibly complex, yeah, irreducibly complex comes from where you thought it came from. Um, the task is much harder because evolution has no foresight. No system can evolve in anticipation of becoming useful once the requisite level of complexity is contained. And he cites the continuity principle. Anyone who studies evolutionary theory closely will see the sharp blade of continuity, whether explicitly by name or implicitly, slicing through origination and transformation hypotheses everywhere. Evolutionary biologist David Penny, for instance, uses continuity to dismiss origination hypotheses for the ribosomes, in invoking its current function because those hypotheses view continuities, pardon me, violate continuity's no foresight rule. The ribosome is a huge, and this is a quote, of course, macromolecular complex and there are many steps leading up to the synthesis of the peptide bond that joins amino acids. There is no way that a ribosome could have evolved de novo in a single step and meet our guidelines of continuity. It is impossible in an incremental model that a very complex structure could evolve for something that does not yet exist. Principle recognized by everybody. That brings us to the second key question. Question two, what were the actual transformational pathways satisfying the continuity role, rule which connect all organisms to the last universal common ancestor? For many leading evolutionary biologists, answering this question leads to a negative outcome for UCD. In 2002, in an article entitled On the Evolution of Cells, Carl Woosey explained why he rejected the historical existence of Luca, the last universal common ancestor, as an actually identifiably unique cell, the progenitor of all organisms alive today. Wussi we'll argued that the <coughs> characters making up the cellular architecture found in the three major domains of life, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, architectures which Wussi we'll himself did, not, uh, did much to discover, are too different to have evolved by descent from a single common ancestor. The transformation pathways from LUCA are therefore too improbable. <clears throat> Take the essential process of DNA replication, for instance. Well, he wrote, modern genome re replication mechanisms seem to have evolved twice, once for bacteria and once for archaea and eukarya. 
The same absence of fundamental similarity was the, uh, observes exists in other basic cellular characters to such a degree that what needs explaining is not why the major cell designs are so similar, but why they are so different. <coughs> Continuity breaks apart the primary evolutionary lineages putatively stemming from Luca, which as a logical consequence must itself vanish as a real organism. Because Luca necessarily associates physiolo physiologies that have not been observed together in any modern lineage and asks that all of this come about through vertical inheritance, Woolsey contends we are left with no consistent and satisfactory picture of the universal ancestor. It is time to question underlying assumptions. And what is the result of that questioning? The universal ancestor, says Woolsey, is not an entity, not a thing. doesn't exist. Extant life on Earth, Woolsey concludes, is descended not from one, but from three distinctly different cell types. Molecular evolutionist W. Ford Doolittle of Dalhousie University rejects Luca on logically identical grounds. Continuity cannot be satisfied. If Luca did not exist, concludes Doolittle, then Darwin arguably was wrong. For most of life and most of its history, descent with modification is not the simple branching process he envisioned. Wilson and Doolittle are not alone in rejecting the existence of Luca and finding UCD false. University of California geneticist Michael Sivanen, and there's quotes to support that, and then French microbiologist Didier Rolt, and then our, our friend Eugene Coonan. Continuity applies as a rule, of course, not just at the base of the tree of life, but upwards into its branches, such as the at the origin of the animals. Evolutionary biologist and embryologist T.J. Horter explains how continuity applies to av animal evolution where the transformations in question necessitate the modification of developmental sequences. When considering such pathways, he writes, there exists an essential requirement which should be met by any, any hypothetical evolutionary sequence. A continuous sequence of morphogenetic events in an embryo is a repetition of a continuous sequence of morphological steps built up through the preceding evolving series of embryos, each stage of which must have functionally must have been functionally advantageous in the transitional organism. This will be referred to as the continuity principle. The law of biogenesis, the origin of life, and UCD as an axiom. S thus far, we've been arguing that UCD and CD are tested by continuity using Modin's tolens. If common descent is proposed for some taxa via a transformational pathway, then continuity must be satisfied along the entire length of the, that pathway. But continuity has not been satisfied, therefore that pathway did not occur, and common descent in this instance at least is false. But common descent and continuity are not the only relevant considerations before us. As soon as we climb up into the tree of life, away from its earliest, simplest beginnings and prebiotic milieu, we immediately collide with another of the genuinely universal propositions in biology, namely the law of biogenesis, that is, all life comes from life. P. D. Medawar and J. S. Medawar call this proposition arguably the most fundamental in biology, and I would agree. It, it's, in its affirmative form, the law of biogenesis states that all living organisms are the progeny of living organisms that went before them. The familiar Latin tag is omni vivum ex vivo. In its negative form, the law can be taken to deny the occurrence or even the possibility of spontaneous generation. The odd thing about the law of biogenesis is that no evolutionary biologist knows exactly when, during Earth's history, the law began to hold universally, as it surely does today, but before which the law could not have been the case. Under any naturalistic hypothesis for the origin of life, the law of bi biogenesis must be violated, spectacularly so, in fact, to get single-celled or single organisms up and running from non-living starting materials. Once upon a time, there was no life on this planet. Everybody agrees with that, including us. Today, there is. At some point in the past, therefore, the law of biogenesis could not have been true. Nonetheless, evolutionary biologists today, unlike their 19th century predecessors, such as Lamarck and Haeckel, would say that after life began its simplest possible form, the possibility of a biogenesis ceased irreversibly 
And from that ill-defined interval to the present, any organism we observe must have descended from at least one parent that was itself an organism. It requires little imagination to see how the law of biogenesis, when coupled with assumptions about the uniqueness of the origin of life on Earth, could yield UCD as a deduction. This is an important paragraph. A deduction, moreover, that renders continuity powerless to test the theory. It simply won't matter if we know the trans transformations pathways from Luca or not. UCD must be true. This explains, incidentally, why pervasive ignorance about the transformation pathway throughout the tree of life rarely counts against UCD. With a single occurrence of abiogenesis, there is literally nowhere else for organismal lineages to go except back to Lucas. And, you know, unless you have three separate origins, you can't separate the tree of life. Skipping on, which brings us to our third key question. Have we genuinely tested UCD or merely assumed it's true? For evolutionary biologists, assuming a single origin of life is a classic good news, bad news move. The good news is that UCD follows as a deductive consequence. All organisms must be related in one great tree of life. The status of UCD as historical fact is assured. The bad news turned out to be exactly the same. By postulating the singularity of a unique one-off event of abiogenesis in Earth history, UCD follows as a deductive consequence, but now UCD becomes untestable. No biological evidence, no matter how compelling, could possibly challenge the theory. Assume a single origin of life event, and because of the law of biogenesis, Luca must have existed, with countless pathways of transformation connecting that primordial cell to all other life, whatever we actually observe. Supposing one thinks, for example, that evidence indicates some animal groups, say the arthropods, did not share a common ancestor, which, as we see, we'll see, is the case. Evolutionary biologist Jeffrey Fryer cites continuity as his reason for doubting the common ancestry of that group. Those interested in tracing the courses of evolution, he writes, are concerned with the mechanism and how one mechanism or complex organism might have been transformed into another, maintaining functional continuity throughout the transformation. Remember, that's the rule. Under the scrutiny of continuity, he argues, it is difficult to envision a common ancestor, even of crustaceans and tracheids. Tracheids are insects, spiders, etc. So they don't have a common ancestor, even though they're both arthropods. No worries. These lineages will still find their branching points and common ancestors somewhere within the tree of life. Maybe they go back to different kinds of worms. Under axiomatic UCD, all discontinuities or disparities in form and function among species can only be apparent, not true or aboriginal differences. Stephen Jay Gould allayed the anxieties of his evolutionary critics by stating, did any proponent of increased disparity ever doubt that a cladogram, a branching diagram of common descent, would root, if not in the arthropoda, at least at a more inclusive level. Now, they go back further, but they're still common ancestors. We are not, after all, creationists, and we do not accept a monophyletic origin, and we do accept a monophyletic origin of life. So he's saying, you got universal common descent, uh, you have to, if you have only one origin of life. Um, and we're not creationists. Interesting. Throughout the history of science, continuing, uh, a widely accepted but erroneous theory may become so deeply embedded within a community of thought that its influence on scientific perception becomes all but invisible. When that occurs, writes philosopher of biology, L. Sober, the theory guides scientific inquiry without being vulnerable to the testimony of nature. We're going to assume it's true, even if it's not really true. So should UCD be held axiomatically? The reader can see for herself how that happens and can decide if she wants to place UCD beyond ordinary testing or to keep the theory vulnerable to the testimony of nature. Gould touched on another aspect of the larger concept, uh, context surrounding UCD. We are not, after all, creationists, he wrote. But why should the issue of creationism have arisen in a technical discussion of arthropod evolution? Time to turn to our fourth key question. Question four, when explaining the history of life, have we assumed methodological naturalism only, 
or have we allowed for the possibility of intelligent design? Gould brought up creationism because, in addition to his paleontological and evolutionary theory labors, he worked as a historian of biology. Gould knew well the reasoning of the biologists and natural historians in the yes, no to design and no to UCD quadrant. Louis Agassiz, whose building uh, uh, Gould worked in at Harvard, resisted UCD for evidential reasons, but also because Agassiz, uh, his scientific worldview included the possibility of intelligent design. Gould understood from his study of Agassiz's work, not to mention the writings of other uh, pre leading pre-Darwinian biologists, that for them, Aboriginal and or primary discontinuity, that is separate origins, not UCD, was the main signal emerging from the fossil record, from comparative anatomy, and from the functional complexities of organisms. Once the possibility of intelligent design has entered the causal mix, of course, the range of explanations possible for any phenomenon grows accordingly. Nowhere is this illustrated more vividly than when we consider the cause of similarities. Overwhelmingly, the principal line of evidence for UCD. All living things have much in common, wrote Darwin in the summation of the origin. Therefore, I should infer from an analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from one, some one primordial form, that is, Luca, the root of UCD. When living things are similar, they must be related by common descent, right? Propinquity of descent, argued Darwin elsewhere in the origin, is the only known cause of the similarity of organic beings. Now, not only is this claim false, indeed Darwin himself knew it was false, but the whole record, uh, what do you do with uh, uh, convergent evolution, for example, but the whole record of comparative and historical biology since 1859 testifies to the incompleteness of similarities to sort misleading resemblance from genuine family relationships. Similarity does not entail common descent, which is only one of its many possible causes. I'm skipping over quite a bit there. If we approach the phenomena of similarity in biology with the possibility of intelligent design in our explanatory toolkit, the gravitational pull of common descent as the only reasonable explanation is greatly weakened, as Paul Nelson was, is saying, as it should be. Hence our final key question. Question five, in the light of intelligent design as a causal possibility, what histories of life on Earth might be the case? Answering that question opens before us a beautiful vista of fascinating research possibilities. The next step requires you and your intellectual freedom. Get started. And that's the end of the chapter. Now my take, I think Paul Nelson makes an important point that is often forgotten. If organisms A and B are nth cousins, and being some large number presumably, they must have a common ancestor C, and all the intermediate descendants must have survived and reproduced that is axiomatic for evolution. Maybe we don't see them in the fossil record, but then the fossil record would have to be defective. It's a logical deduction in that case. If the probability of getting life from non-life is vanishingly small, witness Eugene Kuhn in his 10 to the uh, 1,018th uh, 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 or minus 1,018th as probability, which is vanishingly small, I think, we cannot ask for it to have happened more than once. In that case, UCD is a mathematical deduction. And in that case, for every pair of organisms A and B, they must be cousins of some variety. That not experimental evidence is the source for the certainty that UCD is true. And that is why referring to UCD, and that's specifically the context of what he's, what he's using it, Dawkins could say it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Um, he later added uh, brainwash to the list, by the way. Uh, but notice that you have to omit intelligent design from the list of possibilities. 
if intelligent design is a real possibility, then if we find organisms A and B where the intermediates are either non-existent or non-viable or require jumps larger than evolutionary theory will allow, then separate parentage becomes the most likely possibility. With the evidence we currently have, I would argue, that separate creations do become by far the most likely alternative. Now, we're going to come back to that one statement that I took issue with. It is incorrect, in my opinion, that uh, the philosophies of materialism and naturalism do not entail UCD. For that reason, falsifying UCD would not necessarily threaten those worldviews. If you want to say it would not necessarily logically rule out those worldviews, certainly by itself that would be true. But it does threaten them. And the reason it, is, it does threaten them is it is really hard to have life arise once on Earth without design. And everybody in the field recognizes that. And having it arise twice without design is for practical purposes impossible. And therefore, in the face of massive improbabilities against the transformation of one form to another, design does become much more attractive that is, unless you start out by ruling it out a priori. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, Jack. It's uh, very, very interesting that uh, in your presentation and in the minds of many, Dawkins is the one you go back to when you want to when you want to use this whole idea of universal common ancestry and descent. Uh, apparently Dawkins himself has, written, has forgotten a statement he made in Climbing Mount Improbable, which I might note was published after The Blind Watchmaker. Mm -hmm. About two-thirds of the way through the book, he does some soul-searching and says, well, if you look at the genetic code, and all of the pre-developed proteins that would have to be there to make it work, the original life could not have the genetic code as we understand it. It must have been a simpler type of organism that could, that could reproduce without using the genetic code. And the genetic code evolved to the point where we see it. That's a very fair statement, and it. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, putting that opposite the last statement from Dawkins that everyone is crazy, stupid, or worse if you don't believe in it. Wicked too. Awesome. Pardon me. Crooked. Oh yes. Wicked. 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 And cr yes. Especially right. when you bring up answers that he can't a he can't give. Well, you see. Again, if life originated only once and all life comes from life, then all life had to come from a universal common ancestor. I mean, it's, it's a perfectly logical deduction with no need to do science to figure it out. Except if you look at what that entails, if you start with the genetic code as a common, then you're stuck. Yes, yeah, a comment here, about right behind you. And then... Uh, Right. I don't have a comment other than, a, it's a question actually, aren't there two lines of evolution with plant life and animal life? It, or are they saying that it, it all started with one thing in, in plant life and then became animal life? Or there, where, there, where are we going with this? Well, yeah. as, as I understand it, and uh, Ariel can correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, the theory is that it started as either bacteria or archaea, and then eukaryotes developed with one cell kind of absorbing another cell which became mitochondria, which has its own DNA. And then at that point, that what they call eukaryotic cell uh, could go either in a plant a direction or an animal a direction or a fungus direction, which is really kind of different from plants or animals. And, uh, and so you actually have uh, the two kingdoms that you think of are actually, first of all, they're three kingdoms. And then secondly, uh, they actually do unite into eukarya if, 
if you're trying to make a common ancestor. But uh, Ariel can say if I'm right or not, and and uh, well, go ahead and say what, what you want to. Uh, I think the differences between those are minor compared to some of the more complex things you find later on in the fossil record or in the evolutionary history. I, I marvel that they uh, zeroed in on it. Of course, it's inter they would do that naturally because these are the simple organisms you find there, uh, and life must have been simple to start out with. But, uh, man, you run into much more complex problems than just trying to separate the RKA from the bacteria from... Uh, more advanced organisms. I mean, this. But so some have settled on three different origins. You know, this just compounds the problem. You carry a, um, archaea and bacteria. I know have been proposed as three separate ones. Yeah. But now you have to have life originate three times. Yeah, no, no, it's three times. You know that they're talking about, uh, and so on. And that's a little easier to. Uh, Reconcile of evolution to say that uh, every different group was created. Uh, so you can see that there's some appeal to that thing. But uh, I'd like to get back to this DNA thing since you asked me uh, early suggestions. And uh, you meet this argument many times that, hey, uh, the genetic code is the same. Uh, there are exceptions. But uh, rare exceptions. General well, see, Paramecia had their own... Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> leaving that out of the picture just for now. <laughs> there are, uh, Let's know, not look there. <laughs> uh, what kind of an intelligent god would it be who would design a different genetic code for every organism or every created type? Uh, in other words, uh, I can't imagine uh, if you're going to create something as complex as the genetic code, and this thing is really, I mean, that it, that it exists is really marvelous, uh, that, and that it works. Uh, and then you're going to design a different one for uh, different organisms, and you're going to argue, hey, well, because we have the same genetic code, this... This proves they're evolutionary related. That argument falls apart. Well, what's even more interesting <laughs> is that the genetic code we have turns out to be one of the probably five or six as optimal as possible. Yeah. And in which case, um, the genetic code itself looks designed. Because how did, I mean, you look at how, how typewriters froze on QWERTY. You guys may be familiar with that, that, uh, that uh, it, was a, it was an accident of how it was placed and also it was uh, the fact that typewriter keys used to have to fall back far enough before the next key could come up. And if you had letters separated, it made it easier to have that happen. Um, and so it won a typewriting contest way back when, and because it won that contest, it became the standard. And it makes no sense if you're typing. Uh, the, you know, the alphabet does not go the same. The letters that sound the same are not in the same area. It's a mess. But we keep going at it because everybody learned on it and still learn on it. Um, and the theory at one time was the genetic code was kind of that same kind of accident. It was the first one around, and so it kind of monopolized the, the whole. Um, and yet, in contrast to QWERTY, the genetic code turns out to be one of the five or six most op optimal that there are. Maybe the best, period. It'll be interesting to see whether a paramecium takes advantage of the fact that its code is slightly different from the rest of the code, and in which case it was designed for its own, or its own code was designed for it. And, and by the way, you know, the same argument that could say uh, triplets didn't descend from doublets, 
the same argument can be made for paramecium didn't design, uh, descend from anything else. When I was a student at the University of Michigan, uh, there was a conference on, well, creation kind of unofficial discussion, students and faculty, and one student got up and said, he says, look, you evolutionists, <laughs> you find a muscle in the leg of an organism and you give it a certain name, and you find another muscle in the leg of a different organism, and you give it the same name, and you call it evolution. Uh, hitting at the uh, assumption of, you know, uh, of c common design uh, is evolution. I mean, is, this is this is a fallacy. You know, it it, c it can be, could be either a common designer. Or a common design, and it's it's not a strong argument either way at that level. That uh, it's a strong argument for monotheism, incidentally, which uh, fits nicely with the Bible. Uh, if you want to have many gods, then of course. Uh, so I I think the uh, the commonality argument it needs to be used with caution on both sides. Yeah, I have another question now. So, uh, with the original creation, everything was perfect. No, no death was happening. Then after the fall, something had to happen with genetics and epigenetics for the to be uh, predation and dealing with death and so on. How do we answer those kind of questions? It looks... I know there's a devolution that's going on, but there seems like some evolution had to take place too. So how do we how do we deal with that? I don't know that we have enough data to deal with it in a totally satisfactory way. I'm not sure that um, we have enough data to say that it's an insoluble problem either. Uh, I do know this, that thorns, which are specifically supposed to be one of the uh, uh, one of the creations of the fall, are actually, in some cases, leaves, in some cases, stems, that have uh, degenerated to the point where they don't produce, you know, leaves and so forth on them, uh, that they're actually... Uh, they're gene genetically the plant has lost some information so you could be looking at some of that uh, thing I'm a little bit careful about that because it seems like if there's a curse it seems like God could certainly create stuff that uh, would, uh, would be uh, and the devil could certainly Manipulate stuff to the point where, where there could be new information in that situation. Um, but much of what we see turns out to be degenerative. Now, one of the hypotheses that's around is that there were uh, uh, interspersed elements that got in from eating the fruit, and that got transferred to various parts of the natural world. And um, it would take a little research to see, but it would be interesting to see whether that kind of, of uh, process, that, for example, where the thorns have genetic information that is no longer being used, that, that uh, interspersed elements of some kind turned out to be uh, a cause of that. And I don't know. Um, there's some interesting research possibilities, um, but to my knowledge, they haven't gotten far enough to be able to say too much. Uh, I do know that it's of interest that interspersed elements apparently are necessary for syncytial uh, 
uh, formation in the human placenta. Um, and then it's interesting to speculate that a change there might uh, make childbirth much more painful, which is one of the curses. Um, but there we're speculating way beyond what evidence we have. Uh, I just had a comment in, in relation to my uncle's comment. Welcome, uncle. Um, well, maybe part of the part of um, something else to consider about the pre-fall condition was Adam and Eve's reliance on the tree of life, and maybe there was things in the fruit there preventing entropy. Well, that's certainly a possibility, um, or preventing the effects of entropy. Uh, uh, again, we're when we get too far, we're speculating with very little evidence and. Uh, that's always interesting and nice, but you have to kind of hold those speculations with uh, uh, a little less dogmatism than is sometimes done. Things did definitely change when they lost access to the tree. Yeah. Yeah. So the tree of life is, is part of the picture. I think, that I think there was... I think there was also some degeneracy... Uh, one of the things that would be interesting is, is to find out what happened to snakes to uh, have them have no legs, which appears to be part of the curse as well. Um, and uh, is that a positive design? Is that a negative design? And uh, so there are a lot of questions that you can ask as a creationist. The, the focus of this chapter is to say, is a non-design hypothesis adequate to explain the facts? And I think the answer is not unless you believe in incredible luck. Incredible being the kind of thing where, oh, uh, Gavin Newsom wins the lottery 20 times in a row. Uh, in some cases, without buying a lottery ticket, certainly with only buying a single one. Yes, come in behind you. And then, and then we'll come back to you. I want to... Did you want... Go ahead. Think of the difference between Francis Crick one of the discoverer of the uh, DNA helix. And he's more of a pro-design. He, I guess, I'm not so sure where the sources are. He did mention that he truly believed that uh, DNA was planted. Yes. But yes. On, onto this earth by some what do they call it? Uh, you foreign or out of this earth uh, beings rather than to accept that God was the one who put it here. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, Dawson see the f fallacy of this because the next question is if the designer put it here, then who created the designers. Yes, and, and it's interesting because Dawkins instantly answers that question. He says, yeah, it could have been designed. And then he says, but that designer would have had to have evolved. Well, I don't know. How, how many... Uh, let's see, if we have 4.5 billion years for here... You don't run out of designers for about two or three times until you get to 13.7 billion. The same as he would say that there are two or three steps of evolution that took place. What you realize when people start saying that is they're not opposed to design. They're really not. They're just afraid of where it's going to go and they don't want to go there. 
That's the bottom line. Because when Dawkins can say, well, yeah, it could have been, and I mean, he's on tape. For once he, well, not I won't say for once, because normally he thinks he's got everything so well controlled that he can afford to be honest about the whole thing. And in The Blind Watchmaker, he talks about uh, such things as computers, um, as evidence of design, and we found a computer on a planet, we would know that life had been there once. Well, actually, technically, you can say, first of all, more than that, intelligent life had been there once because amoeba don't build computers as far as I know. And the second thing is that uh, it's less than that because if somebody were to go to Mars today, they might find some very sophisticated contraptions that were designed to roll around and uh, pick up stuff and, and analyze it and everything. Um, and that it would be true even if Mars had no other evidence of life. Uh, and it wouldn't mean that intelligent life had been on Mars. It would just mean that intelligent life had sent those things to Mars. Uh, but uh, but I think that the point is true. You can tell intelligent design. The only reason that they don't want to admit that life is intelligently designed is because if life was intelligently designed, then that means that the designer might actually have contact with us, might actually be smarter than we are, and and might have advice for us that we really don't want to take. That's really what it's about. Um, it's okay to have an intelligent designer as long as that designer doesn't have claims on us. Yes. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, and I left you out. Go yeah, ahead it's first. All right. um, do you think that um, having a universal common ancestor and its origin uh, from you know, non-living particles to living particles violates also the laws of thermodynamics? Like uh, the principle of entropy, for example. In, in one sense, no. In another sense, kind of yes. Um, the, the law of thermodynamics does not require necessarily that everything must get more disorganized. If it did, then ice could never form because ice is more organized than water. But there's a difference between organized and complexly organized. Um, or what's sometimes called specified complexity. And that's when we haven't seen uh, be able to form because primarily, I think, because of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and in that sense, it's probably true that the second law of thermodynamics rules out uh, life forming. Uh, this is an issue that is oftentimes avoided, um, but it's, you know, it's the old monkeys and typewriters aren't going to give you Shakespeare, even though certain processes could give you AB, 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 and in fact do so all the time. Sodium chloride crystallizing out of water is another example. Uh, sodium and chloride ions that are totally random and everything, or at least mostly random, then will come together to form an extremely ordered crystal. But it's ordered in a very simple form. It's not ordered in an informational form. Yes? Oh. <laughs> uh, just coming back to, to uh, this difficult question we face about uh, things aren't all right out there in nature 
and uh, you suggested possibly uh, some interference uh, from uh, Satan. So on getting to that question, uh, it's associated with predation, predation, of course, and we'll be seeing some of that this afternoon, I guess, in the church if you want to go there. Um, um, snake, you know, uh, we, we say, well, he was cursed. That when uh, You get to um, eagles that uh, seem designed to fish and uh, lions that seem designed to uh, destroy with their claws and uh, their teeth and so on. Uh, uh, we don't have answers there. But there's a possibility one degeneration that can be a factor in this. Uh, another factor is a curse that was pronounced. Uh, another factor is that uh, Satan may have been involved, and uh, Ellen White talks about his ingenious methods of amalgamation, which implies that. And then, and some suggest. Uh, well, God knew about the history of this earth and he created it a little differently than we would expect uh, in order to accommodate the great controversy. Uh, so we have a number of ideas there, but we have very little authentication. Uh, and it's difficult to figure out how you would test between those ideas. Uh, you try and use your best judgment and so on, and I'm sure that several of them may be involved, not just one. Yes. Uh, something I've <clears throat> wondered about and talked about over a number of years that you alluded to a few minutes ago. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be totally blown away if some very sophisticated laboratory was, were able to assemble a bunch of bio, biological molecules that were copied from what's working, assemble them, and have an end result that seemed to be living. If it were done in the lab using knowledge and technology, I, I, I could then imagine that they might play with mm -hmm. that and have something new come out of it without the scientific community trying to totally debunk it because it was of human origin rather than there being a designer that goes beyond our human limitations. And I, I think you inferred that, and I think that's one of the major philosophical and intellectual problems with going to design. You don't want to acknowledge outside of humanity the ability that's, that's greater than we possess. No, as a matter of fact, we've gotten good enough to where we can take a cell, remove the DNA, put in our own DNA, and get a creature that is similar to, but not identical to, the original creature. Exactly. Uh, that's not just a theory, it's and, been done. Exactly. Uh, not a problem. But I would point out naturalism, methodological naturalism, if you want to use that term, demands that this all happen all by itself. And that's a whole different game. I, I could not agree more. Uh, the idea that we can do it very carefully in controlled conditions, uh, testing our stuff and then throwing it away if it doesn't work and redoing mm -hmm. it, uh, that's not the kind of thing you expect nature to do on it, its own. It, it, doing it in the laboratory demonstrates intelligent design, uh, yeah. using the term intelligent rather broadly. Okay. Hey, just one comment behind you there. I think the most difficult issue about this whole issue is not f from bio to bio. It is from a bio to bio. 
that jump, no one can answer. But the very fact that we have bio and we are bio, that's the biggest question. Well, I, I agree with you. And in fact, that forms the underpinnings of universal common descent. It's very, very simply, life is incredibly unlikely to have evolved. We hit the jackpot there. Now, once you hit the jackpot there, then you try to get from whatever the original one, maybe it was archaea, to then you have one that going to bacteria. How do you do that? You have to change the genetic information. Uh, the, you have to change the information that creates how you duplicate DNA because bacteria have an entirely different system. Um, you have to change ribosomes. Uh, you, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you have to change. And then going to eukarya, there are other things that you have to change. Um, and you have to do it in an almost directed fashion, but it's still easier than going from non-life to life. And that is the huge power of, you see, if if it happened naturally, then life could only arise once. I mean, it just, it couldn't happen any other way. And if there are transitions that we can't understand, well, there's some theory out there somewhere that we'll eventually figure out and we'll find out how it happened. Because it had to happen. Because mathematically, um, if you have only one life and you have all life from life, then all life had to come from that one life. It's that simple. It's a logical deduction. And it is so firm a logical deduction that Darwin, on down to most of his successors, have kind of agreed with that. Uh, there are a few people who are saying, but wait a minute, you can't do that because you can't have live intermediates for all this stuff. And there are only two answers. Well, they're there. We just haven't found them yet. That's one answer. Uh, the other answer is, well, then there must have been more than one origin of life. But how do you get more than one origin of life without, you know? And I think both of them criticize the other, and both of their criticisms are valid. And as long as you're stuck without an intelligent designer, that's where you have to go. If you accept the possibility of an intelligent designer, then it seems to me that at that point, the probability of an intelligent designer has to be, you know, the inverse of those other probabilities. Um, just kind of almost perforce. And so if you're looking at it from a purely, uh, you know, open objective view, the evidence for a designer is virtually overwhelming. It's the reverse of what they tell you. That is, the evidence for evolution is overwhelming. Well, no, not really. And now the only interesting questions become, and this is where we'll be going next week, the first question is, do humans and chimps have a common ancestor? Because that plays on, um, uh, you know, are we unique or is there, uh, you know, are we just another animal that happens to think more than average? Um, that's the first question. And the next question, which this book will not deal with deliberately, but accidentally deals with in the theological area, how long did it take? And when you get done with those two questions, you have basically the the answer for the creation evolution controversy. Anyway, um, come back next week and we will delve into the fossil record for chimps and humans. And if we're lucky, we'll have a um, a guest with us who uh, knows more about it than probably all of us here put together.